Uh, today I went, had a bulletproof coffee this morning when I woke up, made one, and then went to parties and ran with honey and, and sprinted a little bit too. So I did like a four foot running, that's why I have rolled out my calves before, because my soleus, which is the primary plantar flexor of the foot, which does that, is really like doms, like sore. Rolling it out so I can run again. It's sort of, it's just a massage, right? It's really cool when you know how to massage yourself. Um, yeah, it's just such a life hack. Oh yeah, and then I did jiu-jitsu at lunch. And then, caught up with some friends. That's it, what did I eat today? I had some brisket, brisket and a acai bowl after jits. Um, that's it, and I've got pork belly in the oven right now. So, yeah, pretty hungry to be honest. We're about to do a podcast. Matthew Walden, who's the head of Czech education. Um, he's, he's a real, just, conceptual mastermind of the entire body, not just the muscular system, but the emotional system and the visceral system and the nervous system and just like body as a whole, really good at teaching conceptual points, which is the best way to learn because then you have to remember everything, right? You can start teaching you how to think instead of what to think. It's a really cool, cool thing and rare. I was actually thinking about this on the way here, thinking about like, you know how rare it is? Because really it is, like say someone's got a tip shoulder. It's sort of like you, you got to look at the them under the skin, imagine all the muscles and know where they connect and imagine how you're gonna contract certain muscles to lever it into a better position for stability for the shoulder and know what's short and release it. You know, so if it's a downwardly rotated shoulder and protracted, you know, oh yeah, serratus anterior is short, levator scap may be tight, lats may be tight, pec minor may be tight, all the things that would downwardly rotate the scapula. You gotta check all them, release them maybe, and then contract the opposite that will pull it there, which would be lower trapezius. Serratus anterior also have to rotate it, but if they're protracted, you probably want to release it to set it back. Ooh, I just thought it happened. That's actually don't look at okay. <laughs> I was actually talking to Jake then. <laughs> Stop, weak wings. How's it going? I was just like... <laughs> Animal looked at me, but I was actually talking to you, but through the windscreen. Oh, true. And, it looked, and it was like, it looked like when the camera turned to you, I was like, no, nah, put it back on me. Put it back on me. Look at me, I'm an animal. Animal. Abs are looking nice. Fuck, it's a nice arbor, man. It's beautiful. Mm. What did you get up to for the day? Jits. Surfed. A bit of study. Just the usual, mate. What did you study? Final structures and function. Nice. Check Academy in year three. Nice. Yeah. Sick. And then um You got that one too, eh? Like you already got it as a prereq, don't you? No. Nah. Oh right. It wasn't it wasn't a prereq for IMS3. Oh okay. Well it is now I think, but yeah. it wasn't when I when I did it. That's when I did it. No Walden. So it'd be cool. It's the first time I spoke to him since uh, IMS four. So it'd be cool to chat. Chat. Can't wait. It's gonna be sick. What question should we ask him? No, I'm pretty keen to just like, I want to ask him about like what Paul said about my dad and shit. Yep, Paul cool. said dad was in the room and shit after. Cool. And then just like, yeah, just some total pole stuff. You can just, yeah, just. The jaw. Yeah, the jaw, it'll just free flow. The jaw. Yeah. See about the jaw. Yeah. I want to hear about like, my tip of this. My tip of this. Yeah, yeah. My tip Yeah, and because and, I heard a story on the podcast, I'm talking about the like, recurring hamstring strains. Yeah. Which is like, and the weight there, but yeah. and they turn on the multiplicity and then yeah, it's sick, it's sick. go, which makes sense. Yeah, but it's just cool, you know. Yeah, that's sick. Yeah. How are you folks keeping? You good? Yeah, really, really good, man. I wanted to just ask you a question. That what's what's in the bag? What are you having in your in your smoke at the moment? Because I'm like, I, I love it, dude. <laughs> well, there's a little bit of uh, tobacco, and then there's uh, this one's Mishma. So it's oh, is that, that one? Uh, one of, is that that Alex uh, brand one, or is that? No, it's not actually. This is um, grandfather spirit, which is oh. kind of Paul tends to have you that. Um, we can't they, they, get I think here. Mm. I can't. You? Well, they won't import it. No, nah, no. Nah, like it gets seized nah. and stuff at the at the borders and shit. So that's wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's kind of annoying, but I've been having like I've been making tobacco ones with. Then I've got like uh, bear blends and and uh, Doctor Nick's wizardry oils and stuff. But I'm just I'm loving it. I'm getting hell into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and these oil, these uh, bear blend things also make it quite. Oh, they do tasty. Oils. Sick. Well, it's when I say oils, they're not actually oils, but they they are uh, like glycerin based things. So they're slightly sweet. No, nice. but they um, 
they do a whole range. This one's the clove one. So it's got obviously cloves in it, but it's got like red raspberry, mullein, mugwort, lavender, clove, calendula. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in each one of these. Yeah. So they've got like eight or so of those. And then uh, I normally put a little bit of the uh, Andreas. Yeah, the fennel oil. Fennel oil, yeah. yeah. What, is that, that what does that taste like, like the fennel, the fennel oil? Well, again, it gives it a bit of a sweetness um, mm. and a kind of licorice MCD kind of uh, tang, which is nice. Um, but it's, it's very soothing. So, it's, you know, you can use that for digestive inflammation and things like that. Just, you know, drop it on your tongue and, and swallow it down. But also it's soothing for the lungs. So, you know, obviously you can get a little rough if you have too much smoke, um, you know, sort of rough throat or whatever. So it just makes it much smoother. I like that. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, so it's, it's good. I love it. <laughs> we'll roll the intro music. Yeah. Or? Oh yeah, we roll the intro music or yeah, yeah sick. Sweet. We'll, right. just, we'll just roll the intro music. You and might we'll... you might not be able to hear it, but yeah, for the next we'll start okay. talking okay. when it's done. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, dear cameraman. <laughs> All right, welcome back to the Corrective Culture Podcast. Today we have uh, Sir Matthew Walden for the second time. <laughs> How are you, brother? Sir to us. Yeah, sir to us. <laughs> King Matthew well, Walden. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I've been knighted since last time. Now, now I've been crowned, that's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, last, last time we, we spoke, it's been, it's been a couple of years now. And, yeah, um, it's probably been like... We were just in the garage, were we? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think it was like kind of at the start and like... You'd met Matt, but I hadn't met him yet. And yeah, I was, yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't that. Probably about a year after I did um, that Sydney Sydney workshop with you. Mm. And, yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. And it's been years since that now, you know. And and it's it's cool to see how um, just how how everyone's sort of developed and what everyone's doing now, and how Jake just did IMS four. Yeah, it was IMS four with yeah. with Matt. So I got to spend ten days, or yeah, ten days, and then or nine days was it? Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But also at Paul's house, so I got to see them working together and stuff, and it was man, how how good was that week? And like, as you know, my dad had just passed, so it was such yeah, a yeah. massive like for me just to see uh, a couple of like wise, you know, people that I look up to and be around that energy just meant the world to me because I was going yeah. through it and I was just like, fuck, this is sick. I've got mm. like these wise, solid, solid masculine energies to be around. I don't know, yeah. it just it fucking it's it's the perfect thing. Yeah, if you if you're dealing with something like that, yeah, other people that would have so, been, maybe been through it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was sick, but it was it was such a good course, man. Like the yeah, the I'm still because I haven't done it yet. And I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be doing it. Um, wait, is what? Do you say one's gonna be out in Australia here? That's yeah, that's the plan. So yeah. there should be one early 2025. 2025 um, yeah, so it's definitely. way off, but you know, obviously, there's a bit of preparation to get onto these courses. You have to you know submit case histories and stuff so so yeah. it's probably good that there's a bit of a run-up but uh, yeah that's that's the plan yeah, yeah yeah awesome awesome um maybe even maybe even hosted at your place yeah so definitely knows? yeah well, <laughs> yeah, well yeah. I'm, I'm keen to do it so 100%, Man, we've yeah. got we've got to do more of that like down under because like, i just feel like there's nowhere better we've got all like all the check stuff got the totem pole here we've got all the tools we've yeah, got saunas and ice bars so you could break up your yeah, day right. and have it have a that or you know it's, it's just mm. yeah it's a yeah. perfect perfect venue for it um and but i'm excited right because so what we decided just because the diane lee thing popped up for me so jake's right, like bro. and jake was like gonna do ms4 and i want to do ms4 but this popped up in sydney i was like oh, i won't get to do this much so i yeah, i was like great. i'm gonna go do that while jake does this and i'm gonna teach him all i can from the diane stuff and he's gonna teach me all he can from the ms4 yeah, yeah, yeah. and then i'm gonna go do ms4 well here that's where i'm gonna do it <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah yeah perfect Perfect. Yeah. That's great. So, Diane's a fantastic teacher, isn't she? She's she's amazing. Oh man, I um I listen to yours and her podcast a couple times now, and mm. and there'll be some cool. I, I was actually like a really cool thing that was rare that I think people would love is like you were telling a story about a a reoccurring hamstring strain, and mm. and how when you activated the multifidus that you may have found was atrophied or or, or not working, that mm. in, on the spot this guy's hamstring lengthened, and yeah, and 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 it makes sense, you know what I mean. But like, it, that yeah. wouldn't make sense to a lot of people, right? Mm. So, yeah, 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 yeah. you don't know what you don't right. know. So, I'd yeah. love to just get a little chat on that because that's such a cool story, and I'm so interested in that mm. sort of stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, so so 
we used to run these um, kind of Czech meetings here in London. And uh, what we would do is, you know, we'd get sort of 20 or 30 Czech practitioners turning up and, um, you know, we'd have a couple of speakers that would be t- t- talking on different topics. Um, but I also said, look, if you've got a client you want to bring along and we can kind of do a live assessment, uh, then, then do that. And on this one occasion, one of the guys brought in a, a, a quite a good basketballer who's in the England basketball team, um, but who's getting this recurrent hamstring strain, right? Do you want me to stop while the, while the siren's on in the background? No, that's all right. We're, <laughs> We're coming, coming to get you. Coming to get you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, that's good. Um, but uh, so, so, you know, we did did just standard assessment as as we're looking at it. We could see some striations in his low back, which is an indication that that multifidus isn't firing optimally for whatever reason. Um, but he didn't have any back pain; it's just his hamstring issue. Um, so that was the first little clue, because you know one of the things with the hamstrings is that they they will upregulate their tone. There's a physio that that is a friend of Diane Lee's, actually called Barbara Hungerford, and she uh, wrote a paper I think in 2003 where she showed that when people have in that case, it was sacroiliac joint pain, um, so low back pain, that the multifidus would stop working, which which was not new information. You know, that being established in the 90s, that this multifidus muscle switches off when there's low back pain. And one of the challenges is, like, how do you get that working again, which you guys are experts in? So, so that was not new. But what was interesting, she was measuring the EMG to the actual hamstrings, uh, as well as a few other muscles. And what she found was that the hamstrings were upregulating their tone in the people with low back pain. And so, you know, we, we know that the hamstrings, particularly the biceps and Morris hamstring, is one that will upregulate its tone to try and stabilize those sacroiliac joints, um, particularly if something else isn't doing its job. And in this case, the multifidus wasn't doing its job. Mm. So anyway, this, this guy, you know, laid down on the treatment table and we did a test called the active straight leg raise test, which again, both of you guys know about that. Basically, the person just lays on their back, lifts their leg up straight, and, you know, most people who are functional, don't have any pain, they'll get their leg up to, say, 70 degrees, sometimes higher if they've got more flexibility, but they, they'll get up to sort of 70 to 90 normally is the sort of range um, with no real effort, um, no pain. Uh, and so that's what this guy did on his good side. On his bad side, he picks it up, he gets to about 40 degrees, right? So he's kind of, kind of you know, th- this mm. kind of angle. And, and basically he's got, oh, there's my hamstring. I can feel my hamstring strain. And you're like, okay, all right, fine. Let's, let's pop that back down again. So he puts his leg back down. And then we do these these uh, sort of reinforcements where essentially what you're doing is you're taking the role of a muscle. So, you know, first of all, you squeeze across the pelvis and you're kind of acting like the transverse abdominus muscle um, and got him to lift his leg up. and didn't make much difference, still feeling that hamstring strain um, and this kind of pull in the hamstring. And you can see he's a bit sort of anxious about it because obviously, you know, this is his career essentially and, and he keeps getting these strains. So he's, he's a bit sort of, uh, you know, upset by it all. And... Um, I'm just going to turn off my my uh, notifications. Sorry, should have, should have done that before. That's right. That's right. We can't hear <laughs> it. Can't hear it. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay, that's good. Um, so, um, so then, what I did was I put my hands around his back, and you essentially do the role of the multifidus. So you put your hands in a certain way and, and pull slightly, lift slightly, and um, and he did the same active straight leg raise. And this time, his leg just went right the way up to about seventy degrees. Wow! And it's like. And and he and he kind of looked at me as if I'd done so. Like what what just happened? Mm. And he said I didn't I didn't feel it. And I'm like, well, that tells us what's going on. Then you, you know your hamstring is upregulating its tone to try and stabilize because your multifidus isn't doing the job it should do. Yeah. And so you know essentially it wasn't really a hamstring strain at all. It, it was uh, you know that perhaps there was a little bit of hamstring trauma, but the fact he didn't even feel it when he picked it up. Mm. You know, which we, of course if you lift your leg up, it stretches the hamstring. And the reason he could only get up to about 40 degrees without any assistance is that, you know, his hamstring is going, well, yeah, I want to relax because the brain is, is, is telling the leg to lift up. So it should relax to let the leg come up. But because his brain or his nervous system is aware that that sacroiliac joint is not stabilized properly, then it upregulates its tone and it tightens down. And, and to him, it felt like it was being pulled, like it was being strained. So the minute I've done that role for his multifidus, the brain goes, oh, Sweet. this sacral joint, is, you know, there's no problem here. Mm. And so it just makes the leg come right the way up. So it's a great example of where, you know, if you just look at the symptomatic area, you know, the sort of historical way that a lot of physical therapists would work with that, someone's got hamstring strain, well, you know, you rub the hamstring, right? You know, you, you get in there, NMT the hamstring, you stretch the hamstring, you know, you might strengthen the hamstring, but that wasn't the issue. You know, the issue was somewhere else in the body. The hamstring was the compensation for the issue. So, yeah. the, so obviously... 
you know, Have as an his trainer, with various multiple. And, and yeah, with, yeah. with your, were you trying to, were you sort of pulling apart the, the front and force closing the back to sort of act as the multifidus or with your, comp- yeah, what you do is, is, is you put your hands behind the back and, and you essentially put your hands where the multifidus is and you pull out slightly. Right, on so the, the, it. Yeah, because, you know, the multifidus down at that low part of the back um, is, is the only muscle that's actually there between the spinous processes in the middle. And the pelvis, which is maybe, you know, most people two, three centimeters away from the midline. And so when it contracts, just like any muscle, like if you contract your bicep, it swells up a little bit, doesn't it? And yeah. so the muscle does the same thing. It swells up a little bit and actually pushes out the iliac crest or the, or the, the ilium, let's say. And in that ilium being moved outwards, it actually tensions the sacred ligaments. So now yeah. the ligaments are strung tight and the joint is stable. Okay. Yeah. But if the multifidus either isn't firing or, of course, if it doesn't fire across time, you start to get atrophy in the multifidus. And we know this, you know, we've seen this, you know, for, for, again, decades on MRI scans that the multifidus will, first of all, not fire. So it kind of instantly loses actually about 30, 31 percent of its cross-sectional area. Right. So, you know, when you scan a muscle using an MRI or using ultrasound or whatever, you can see the, the thickness of the muscle. Right. And what they found is that on the painful sides, the average cross-sectional area, so the average thickness of the muscle, is about 69% of the asymptomatic side. Okay, so yeah. so you kind of look at it, well, that's, that's interesting. So, you know, how can, and this is within 24 hours of the back pain coming on, mm. okay? It's quite an important point because, you know, a muscle can't atrophy in 24 hours. Yeah. So how can you go from, you know, being presumably somewhat symmetrical to suddenly, you know, losing almost a third of its its cross-sectional area. It's like that's impossible physiologically for it to, to atrophy that quick. It takes about two weeks for atrophy to begin to kick in, uh, is, is the figures that I'm aware of anyway. Um, but um, so so the solution to that is that, well, that cross-sectional area is, is all about the tone in the muscle. So it's not it's not that the muscle has actually shrunk. It's just that it's not engaged, right? So again, you know, when you contract your bicep, it goes yeah. from being flat to being bulged up, right? <laughs> Same with the multifidus. So when there's actually neural drive going to that multifidus, it swells up. So then when the neural drive is inhibited because of the pain, now it loses its swelling, if you like, and so it becomes about 30% smaller, okay? Yeah. So that's, that's essentially what what happens um yeah, I, a, I can't remember if that answers your question yeah <laughs> no that that was perfect and and just for people listening because not everyone that listens is sort of body related for if you were to explain Ooh. the sort of diagonal uh segmental stability of the multifidus in in the the anatomy and and why yeah. that's so important not just at the si joint but every vertebrae really yeah well so i mean it, it basically it's kind of shaped like a christmas tree it kind of go, goes up like this right so so it goes from from a, a slightly more lateral position away from the midline more towards the midline higher up by normally two to three segments um and so essentially its role is to extend and rotate the spine because of the way it inserts into the bones but it's very close into the axis of rotation so it's very close to the vertebrae it's the closest muscle in and so what we know about muscles is that the closer they are into the spine or the deeper they are the more tonic they are, which means they hold tone. That's what, where the word tonic comes from, right? So they just hold tone. And that's what we're using now just to sit here and, and chat. If we had no muscle engagement, we kind of flop and sag into our chairs, right? Um, but but just to, to sit here, we've got our tonic muscles are all engaged to some degree, and that's what's holding us up, right? Now, if we then go to stand up or move or walk, then the more outer muscles, what we often call the outer unit muscles, so that would be things like both the the uh, erector spiny in, in, in the spine, but also the outer fibers within the multifidus, they are a little bit more phasic. And so phasic means that they phase on and then they phase off, phase on, phase off. That's where, the again, the term phasic comes from, is that they're not designed to just hold tone all day long. Mm. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because they're anaerobic, right? So so if, if a muscle's anaerobic, then obviously that means that it builds up oxygen debt. Right. So and in building up oxygen debt, the, what, what uh, probably everyone will have experienced at some point in their lives is this sort of build up of lactic acids. Right. And that's what happens when you, you know, run for, say, you know, 400 meters or something, or you lift the weight to the point where you're starting to fatigue and, and, and you're start, starting to burn a bit in the muscle. That's the lactic acid and the pyruvate being produced in the muscle because you're moving uh, 
at a speed or at an intensity that means you, you can't just do that with your tonic muscles. You've got to use the phasic muscles. Mm. And so the phasic muscles produce the lactic acid and then you start to feel the burn as it were. Um, so, so, you know, back to the multifidus, multifidus, the deep fibers that are in next to the spine, they're tonic. So they, they don't get lactic acid buildup. They're, they're aerobic. So they can just stay on all day long without complaining, mm-hmm. assuming they're working properly. Yeah. But it's, pain that creates inhibition to the tonic fibers specifically so the tonic fibers the ones that hold tone get switched off um i don't know if that answers your question that that definitely no that that definitely answers it and and it really represents when we think of core now you almost got to think of uh the tonic core of the entire body not just the stomach (laughs) you know oh yeah 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 yeah, like it tells you it tells you because i what i see a lot now and some really sort of smart people, but they'll talk about only going to the gym for hypertrophy. And I see this like, why bother doing this when if you do eight reps, you you can you can get this uh, catabolic response and and so on. Like the purpose is just to put on muscle mass for glycogen or whatever it may be, right? But no one really mm. talks about the importance of why you need long time and attention training until you hear yeah. things like that, right? Mm. Wait until you hear that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. And it makes so much sense when you think, oh, what is good posture? It's it's staying like this for a long period of time and not slouching, right? Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. literally, literally training that. And how you see in um, which which IMS two we do the Sorensen test, right? Yeah, IMS two yeah. we do the Sorensen test, where where you can get someone and getting them doing a, a trunk extension. Is that what you'd call that? Trunk extension? Yeah. yeah. So on the I GHD like machine, pretty, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah, and um. And just seeing where it gives out, you know, mm. and, and that a lot of people don't last very long at that. And it's, it's surprising. And especially fit young men, I find. Yeah, <laughs> I find yeah. quite often male personal trainers are often the worst at Sorensen test because they're so, they've been tra- training the phasic system so much, but not the tonic system. Yeah. Oh man, I worked with a professional athlete and in a prone cobra, they, they lasted about a minute and a half, you know. Right. So right. Yeah. it's, uh, Actually, yeah, mo- that's, that's crazy. <laughs> most, most people are pretty bad. eh? it's crazy. Yeah. And that's what I love yeah. about the, like, even at IMS one or IMS, I think it's IMS two. I think they really, does IMS one show you all the, all the core stuff? Like all the, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah like does, those yeah. tests, man, which I, I never skip. Cause it's like, it's something that definitely needs to be addressed. eh? it's like, if the yeah, TBA yeah, yeah. ain't firing, you got to address that. If the multifidi isn't firing, you got to address that. And it makes it so simple for you to just be like, okay, well, I know if I get this core all working as an inner unit, um, they're going to be so much better off and most likely take all their back pain away. I remember at the start, yeah. I was healing people's back pain. I was like, this is mind blowing. Like yeah. all I'm doing is following the <laughs> blood pressure cuff and the, you know, all the basics. Like, yeah. And, it's and crazy. I think it's cool. Like for people to hear like why the hamstring why why the hamstring uh turns on for a a lacking multifidus for that mutation like if you could break that down because it sort of acts as the 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 force closure mechanism instead of the multifidus is that right that's right that's right so i mean it's got a couple of roles you know one thing is that um because of where it inserts into the pelvis it draws the pelvis posteriorly and when the pelvis is rotated posteriorly that locks the sacroiliac joint so that's as you say the actual rotation of the pelvis is is uh, creating form closure okay so it's form closure meaning that the ligaments are being strung tight because of the position of the pelvis but also there's force closure which is actually the contraction of the muscle it's a lot of that um force is transferred up through the sacrotuberous ligament so for those that are not familiar with the anatomy, the hamstring, particularly this biceps femoris, but actually also semitendinosus as well. So there's three hamstrings, right? Mm-hmm. Semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and biceps femoris. And the tendinosus and, and the biceps femoris both have direct insertions into the sacrotuberous ligament. And the sacrotuberous ligament runs from tuberous, that, that's from, from the initial tuberosity. So that's where the hamstrings in the anatomy books, that's the, you know, they all say, oh, well, the hamstrings insert into the initial tuberosity. That's your sitting bone, right? Mm. But actually, the research that's gone into looking at the sort of micro detail of, of the insertion, it shows that these muscles actually have fibers that go straight into the sac tuberous segment, which runs from that sitting bone, the, the ischial tuberosity, right the way up to the sacrum, hence sacro tuberous, right? And so it actually goes into the fascia that spans the sacroiliac joint. And so it actually, as the biceps femoris contracts, it creates force and um 
a kind of closing mechanism across the sacroiliac joint on that side. Wow. So it's a, it's a normal and functional thing for the hamstring to stabilize the sacrum as you're moving or the sacroiliac joint as you're moving. What's not normal is for it to be trying to stabilize tonically when you're just sitting around or standing around. And of course, if your multifidus isn't doing what it's supposed to do, in the case of this basketballer, you know, think of a game of basketball, you know, how, how much time are you standing? Well, the whole time, right? So the biceps is trying to do the role of the multifidus the whole time, but the, the biceps, uh, as in as in the, 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 the hamstring biceps morris, mm. is um, it's a, mainly a phasic muscle, mm. right? So, so it doesn't like holding tonically because it builds up lactic acid. It starts to get tight. It starts to get sore. And then it feels like you've got a hamstring strain. Right, which is exactly what this guy was experiencing. But it's, a, it's an important point, I think, that you brought up there, Callum, because, you know, we've, in the Czech system, and I think in the world of rehab for, for you know, a few decades now, have talked about the importance of this kind of inner unit or the transverse abdominis or these deep muscles, core stabilizers, that kind of thing. Um, and a little bit about tonic and phasic function. But a lot of people don't really understand that, which is why I've kind of tried to, yeah. you know, go into the basics around it. Mm. <laughs> The um, the tonic system is the system that gets inhibited by pain, like we said, but it also gets inhibited by visceral reflexes. Mm -hmm. And it's also more linked in with the emotional system, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the point is that any of those things can affect tonic function. And then just like I was saying with that, the biceps femoris or, or any muscle in the body, even though they're often categorized as either tonic or phasic, that's the kind of massive simplification because every muscle has both tonic and phasic fibers okay mm -hmm. um so multifidus is mainly tonic but it has some phasic fibers which are typically more superficial they're more peripheral and then the deep ones the ones which are closer into the spine or you know any joint the ones that are deep or closest into the joint are more tonic because they're holding the tone and then the phasic ones are more superficial and they're the ones that move the joint right so that makes logical sense. If you know a little bit about physics and levers and mechanics and this kind of thing, then, then it makes sense that the, you get better leverage to move a joint if you're further from the axis of rotation. Mm. Okay. And a good example of that is, you know, with the quadriceps, you've got the, the they, they actually kind of pass through the kneecap and then attach down into the tibia. Mm. Well, the kneecap is there, the patella is there to actually take the quadriceps further away from the axis of rotation of the joint. So if the kneecap's kind of out in front of the tibia, it takes the axis of rotation further away from the joint, which allows you to have more power to extend the knee or to resist uh, flexion of the knee. Like when you're running, you know, you load the body. And, you know, like when you're sprinting, for example, you've got 33 times body weight being transferred through your, your quads. Mm, I mean, yeah. like spotting yeah. 33 times body weight. <laughs> it's mm, like, jeez, yeah. it's implausible, fun. right? But but so so the patella, the reason I'm going down this path is that the patella is acting, um, I mean, it's called a sesamoid bone, but it's acting to um, increase the leverage on the joint. Mm. So if you think about um, the multifidus or, or any muscle, if the tonic system is compromised because of pain or visceral somatic reflexes or emotional disruption um, or, or, you know, across time, atrophy of the inner unit or the, these tonic fibers – then what happens is the muscles that sit over the top of them or the, the fibers that sit over the top of those, the phasic fibers, they get closer to the axis of rotation of the joint. And that yeah. means you lose power, Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, there was lots of debates about this back in the early 2000s when this was fairly new. A lot of the research came out in the 90s, mid 90s. And so it became a thing. It was kind of trendy to talk about core stability and all this kind of stuff. And of course, you've got people that were resistant to that and were kind of antagonistic and, you know, some very elite strength and conditioning coaches saying, well, I don't ever do any of that stuff and I get record holders and all this kind of thing. But so there's always like a debate over, well, should, should a sprinter even train their, their uh, inner unit, you know, and their, their tonic system? And, and a lot of these strength and conditioning coaches say, no, you don't need to because you don't use those muscles when, when you're sprinting, which, you know, is a complete misunderstanding of how mm. the body works to yeah, start off with. Totally. But, but B, you know, if you're thinking about generating power, you absolutely need to have a, a tonic system that is not just working but is somewhat hypertrophied in order that you get better leverage on the joints for the phasic system right yeah that that's um, that's a deep uh, that's, that's a deep level deeper, man but it makes it makes day. sense you know and you know what i think with because we get people coming at us all the time like say um 
there's no no evidence that anterior kilt, uh, excessive anterior tilt causes pain, right? But right. this is where I think is a big gap in the entire industry, and this is why I think why it's so good with the Czech stuff teaching you how to think and not what to think, is that when when you just hear what you just said, then you know what I mean. When when but mm. not even that. If you can just look at it and see the lumbar compression, sometimes yeah, you can put it and get the degrees right, but you can mm. literally see it from an ex, like it just looks compressive. And then when and also when you connect the person to their body, you can take them to the area that feels uh, or, or that should be orthopedically right. And nine times out of 10, the person's like, oh, that does feel good there. So you bring in an awareness yeah. to it. And I think about forward ball roll. Now I barely cue it with my hand under there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell them to roll out and say, tell me where it feels the best. And they'll say there and they'll slide it there. And if it's pretty accurate, I might tell them to change it. Does it feel better there or there? But really you'll connect with their body. And that's, that's what it's all about. You know, I think that's, that's yeah, such yeah. a cool thing that, um, well, yeah, and that was that was Feldenkrais's whole concept was that you increase awareness through movement, right? Um, and so, you know, a lot of people, it, it's normal that we move unconsciously in terms of, you know, we don't have to think about how to walk or how to squat to sit into a chair or whatever it is, whatever the skill might be. Um, so we develop these movement patterns and sometimes they're, they're great and functional um, uh, and and everything works well. Sometimes they're not so functional, and things are less efficient than they can be. And you know, joints aren't quite moving in an optimal way. And across time, that creates stress to the joint or to the disc or whatever it might be. Mm. And so you end up getting symptoms. Yeah. And so to, to sort of then address the posture uh, is absolutely critical. It's it's a bit like you know, there's a lot of um, you know criticism and controversy around things like maintaining a neutral spine which is what you're talking about there with yeah. with the full ball um and, and that's because often in research people break things down they look at them so in such an isolated way um and they assume things like with a neutral spine obviously we teach that as a concept in the czech system but we don't say you should only be in neutral we don't say you know you've got to squat every time in neutral you've got to bend every time in neutral because you know, we might teach someone to do a Jefferson curl, for example, which is full flexion mm. through the spine. Mm. Or we might give them a Swiss ball crunch, which is full extension and full flexion of the spine. You know, so so the point is, is that, and Diane Lee, actually, you mentioned, you know, her earlier, right from the 90s, she had this in her rehab protocols, is that neutral spine is a skill that everyone should be able to do. They should have an awareness of it. And then you can move beyond that into more functional movement patterns. The criticisms of uh, of things like neutral spine and posture and so on is where they're looking at people who have been through some kind of posture training and now they're moving like a robot. They're not, yeah. you know, they're, they're kind of keeping a neutral spine for everything. Um, and, and of course that becomes problematic and it can induce anxiety and it makes you feel like you're not moving like a human, you're moving like a robot. right? Mm. Um, so, uh, but, so that's where the problems kick in. Mm. But the analogy I, I would use is that the neutral spine is like, getting back to the center of the tennis court in a rally, right? You know, the idea is, is you should always return to the center of the court or, or as close as you can. You know, you're not going to get to the center of the court between each shot, but you don't want to go out to the left-hand side of the court. That would be in left side bending. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to go right up to the front of the court and stay there because you're going to get lobbed. That's, that'd be flexion. You don't want to go right the way back in extension and stand behind the baseline. You want to get back to the middle of the court each time. And that should be the default that you move back to. It doesn't mean that you stay in the center of the court right? Because if you stay in the center of court, you're also going to lose. You need to be able, so the center of the court obviously is the analogy for neutral spine, right? Yeah. So you want to return to neutral spine, center of the court, as much as you can between movements, but then you want to be able to go to any part of that court to be able to play the game. Yeah. You said yeah. You, you said that at our IMS4, which I thought was pretty cool. Like all of the primal patterns are really like to teach you how to be an anatomical neutral. And once you know how to be an anatomical neutral, then your body knows and your nervous system knows a safe place to come back to. And then you can work outside of that. And I thought that was brilliant. exactly Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, well, I feel like that, the over toes guy, isn't it? You know, and, and, yeah. and the way that, you know, as much as it's important to be able to go knees over toes, that's an advanced version of, of a, of a functional lunch. Mm. Right. Um, or, well, I mean, if, you, if we're talking about the lunch pattern specifically, you want to be able to lunge first of all in with a neutral lunge with a, yeah. with the, the, the chin vertical and to do that optimally and then to build that up and do it under load and do that in multiple directions. And once you can do that, then that's a great time to go knees over toes. But if you go knees over toes first, 
you're putting huge stress into that anterior cruciate ligament. Mm. Uh, and, and this is mm. the, the danger is that, is that you, you can, I mean, most people are quad dominant in any instance when you assess them, which means that their quads are working more than they should. And normally their, their glutes, sometimes their hamstrings are working less than they should. Um, so obviously the solution to that is to, to train up the glutes and to, to train up the movement patterns so that they're recruiting the glutes. But if you go knees over toes straight away, you're just pushing them further into a quad dominant pattern. And, and that's not a good idea in the early stages of training. But equally, you don't want to only lunge in a neutral uh, sort of lunge pan because that's not how you function. Again, go back to the tennis court. You don't want to teach people to lunge and just maintain a neutral upright shin the whole time they're going to have to be able to reach and go into a quad dominant lunge to get to the ball you know yeah. so that's that's an advancement or what we we call an ascended primal pattern yeah yeah and and i think that's coming back to feeling it right like when you when you feel it generally it's going to be in a good position most of the time but obviously during sports and that you're going to be you're going to be going forward in that but you don't have to rep it over and over and over again in the gym and and excessively load that pattern when really yeah, the safety of the joint is probably the best thing for your longevity in, in the career because you're going to be doing that when you train anyway. You're going to be doing that when you're doing the sport in most things. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. The, um, yeah. the, the Czech totem pole, like I was so amazed at it, at, at the how much thought, like when, when I, I guess it was the final piece, I guess, because like IMS3, like when we and Cal did it, we, it was pretty like, about discs and things like that. There's some real, it was cool. We went over a lot of IMS2 stuff, but level four was like, I feel like tied it all together again. Right. And with right. the toe, yeah, yeah. And, and I feel like the, the neck and the jaw and the eyes and the ears are such a missing link. But mm-hmm. I couldn't believe how much, like when Paul would come in and talk and how much work he had put into that totem pole. Like it's just like, it's not just a, a thought up thing. Like there's been years and years and years and years of, testing and shit like that and it was just yeah yeah yeah. it absolutely yeah yeah, it blew my mind like do you do you use that obviously like you've done it for so long now i'm sure you have so much stuff up your sleeve but like is that your kind of like you're like okay the jaw i'm gonna test the jaw now because you're always following that totem pole still to this day or do you have a lot of stuff up your sleeve where you know or well yeah i mean yeah that you chop yeah you know like yeah it does depend a little bit on, on, on how I'm working and who I'm working with. You know, sometimes a, a mate of mine that I've been playing football with will, will, will come in and say, oh, I've hurt my knee. Can you have a quick look? And, yeah. and so I'll, I'll work a bit more like a, an osteopath yeah, with so you. Yeah, true. The knee, look around it a bit. Like, check me on. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's like you've got 30 minutes to, to, yeah. to do it. Yeah. yeah. That's that's essentially what they want is is a bit of work around the knee. But, but you know, when clients come to me for, for a full assessment, then, yeah, um, or, or even if they're coming in and they've got something that is just a little bit kind of resistant to um, other people's treatment. So, you know, they've seen a few people, hasn't seemed to resolve. Then that's always a clue that probably, you know, the issue isn't at the area where the pain is, but it's away from it. You know, something else is driving that. Mm. And, you know, when we talk about the totem pole, I mean, you guys probably talk about the totem pole a bit anyway, but just to, to sort of expand on it mm. briefly, it's it's this concept that Paul developed back in the 90s, which is, that the body has a, a kind of hierarchy of reflexes. And so, you know, some of these reflexes, well, all, all of them really are, are important for survival. So things like being able to keep your eyes level with the horizon, that allows you to judge distance, it allows you to balance properly, allows you to focus properly. And so, and it takes takes stress off of the eyes themselves. You know, if it, I don't know if you ever watch TV laying on your side or, 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 you know, head on the pillow or something, it doesn't take long and you start to get, achy in your eyes and that's because the, the little muscles in the eyes are actually trying to twist your eyeballs to get them back on the horizon right yeah, yeah. Um, and so so the and, and the, the the muscles in the eyes are pretty fast twitch they're designed to be able to really move the eyes quickly well can, so they can don't the eyes lock. rotate yeah yeah when oh you, when you man turn, when you turn your head they do <laughs> I this never knew that. <laughs> I didn't knew, I've, I've had these eyes my whole life i didn't know they rotate <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that was trippy that test you showed us for the what eyes the Man, and were they, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we released the eye muscles with a cotton bud, dude. Yeah. I, I haven't done it yet, but fuck, it was yeah. one of the craziest feelings. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, right. But so, you know, Paul, Paul sort of came up with this concept that there's certain uh, functions in the human body that are absolutely essential for survival, like like being able to focus properly, being able to balance properly, being able to eat, being able to breathe, and so on. 
And, um, and and when you study the neurology of it, you start looking down into you know how the body prioritizes the the, the system. What what you find is that the body. Is... Uh oh. Uh -huh. and the ability for the head to function because it's like it's your, it's your special sensory platform right it's giving you the most information about the world um and so the totem pole really incorporates breathing first and foremost well in fact psyche in fact uh you know in terms of how you're perceiving things breathing which obviously is very much linked into how you perceive things uh because if you perceive something as very sort of stressful or anxious uh anxiety provoking then that's going to change your breathing rate right? Um, and if, if breathing is compromised, you, you don't have long to survive. So you will sacrifice other parts of your neck or your spine or whatever to enable an optimal uh, respiratory excursion. So the ability to mechanically breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and then that might end up causing low back pain mm -hmm. because your body's more interested about your lungs working than your lumbar disc working, for example. Because, you know, you, you can survive with a lumbar disc. It's painful, you know, with a lumbar disc injury. Um, but you can't survive without breathing. So so it will prioritize the respiration. And so then you see these patterns where people might, you know, have a tight, low back muscle or a kind of funky posture, whatever it might be, uh, because they've got issues with the rib cage or their ability to actually breathe. And they're trying to adjust their posture to optimize the breathing mechanics and therefore sacrificing structures in the low back or in the, the the lower limbs so that's respiration next one down is tmj which is jaw joint and of course that's very linked in with eating um and you know neurologically it's connected to kind of everything in the brain more or less um and so you know if you've got um a tmj issue uh some kind of increased tension in the jaw then that will tend to affect visual function it'll tend to affect balance it can affect hearing sometimes it will affect neck posture because you tend to get muscles tight on the same side that the jaw is uh tight or irritated um and so then you know as soon as that happens you know you end up now your eyes are off balance so the eyes are the next one down in the totem pole and so your body will shift the weight underneath to get the eyes back on the horizon and again now you're back to compromising the function of joints below in order that you maintain the function above right so that's the kind of basic concept with the totem pole and it carries on down through yeah. through uh, different systems yeah. um it's amazing it's amazing yeah, and phenomenal i remember like with the tmj i heard you talk about it with andre hedger and how mm. and again all this stuff just makes sense when you think of it all like yeah you can know the anatomy and the insertion origin but like when you think of it all as sticky tissue you can start to see the same things you know? Right. And then when you tie yeah, yeah. the, the insertion origins to it, it gets even more precise. So like when yeah. you were mentioning how a head that hangs forward, all that, that, that tissue, what would it be exactly too? That, um, that would, could slide that mandible back and, and enclose that TMJ from a forward head yeah. posture, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And well, I mean, you'd be you're super in for higher group of muscles will be strong, uh, kind of, they'll be, they'll be taut, let's say, yeah. um, uh, so that they, they can pull the jaw back um but yeah it, it could also be things like your temporalis muscle you know that also pull, pulls the jaw back um so you know it could, could be a number of uh possibilities but um but you know one of the things that we know about forward head posture is it links back into the totem pole is that if you can't breathe effectively through your nose you'll tend to push your your head forwards mm -hmm. so that you can breathe more optimally through your mouth because if your head's in a neutral posture the tongue tends to be up and in its rest position and that means you you, you can't mouth breathe Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to open the oral airway, you move the head forwards. Okay. And so you'll do that reflexively without even thinking about it if you've got a blocked nose. So if you've got a cold or something like that, you tend to go into a forward head posture, open your mouth, and you'll be breathing through, through the mouth. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, it's not just with the cold, it's often with things like uh, food sensitivities, you know, or, or um, anytime the immune system is sensitized. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if there's, pollen in the air if you're overexposed to to toxins uh you know if you're overexposed to stress and you've got a leaky gut um if you're using pain medications and that's causing a leaky gut which is a very common side effect of particularly the the NSAIDs the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen and neurofen and those kinds of things right. that will create a leaky gut alcohol creates a leaky gut and as soon as you get a leaky gut then what that means is that your immune system gets sensitized because about 70 percent of your immune system lines the gut and that's, you know, that's uh, 
an official uh, an official sort of stat you know it's not that's not some kind of you know random kooky uh stat that's that's popped out of nowhere mm. you, you can find that in medical training and so on and it's it's because the gut is the place where you're taking in stuff that's non you right? it's, it's non-self right it's other organisms it could be a you know a cow or a mm-hmm. sheep or a bit of broccoli or you know whatever but it's another organism mm. and you're trying to actually take it inside your very being right so you need to have a really effective immune function at that border you know everywhere else like with your skin you're not trying to absorb stuff through your skin you know you're not i mean you're trying to absorb things through the through your lungs but it's just gases mainly you know so you, you've of course got a fair bit of immune function around the lungs but you've got way more immune function around the gut um and so if the gut's leaky the immune system gets sensitized what does that look like well Basically, is is the first line of of defense is that your body goes into a more inflammatory state, okay? Because that that upregulates immune function. The mucous membranes produce more mucus because that helps to defend against. Because essentially, the body thinks it's being attacked if there's a leaky gut, so you produce more mucus. But the mucous membranes also swell up, okay? And so the mucous membranes you find, of course, you know anywhere there's mucus, but also you know up the nose. And this is one of the things that a lot of people don't realize about having colds is that when you get a blocked nose, you know, people assume they're no, all blocked up with, with snot, you know, with catarrh, whatever. But actually most of that blockage is the mucous membrane swelling and making a smaller and smaller uh, kind of canal. And then you produce a little bit of mucus and that blocks that, that canal, right? So, so you've actually narrowed the nasal passages right down. That's exactly what happens when you've got a food sensitivity. Your, your nasal passages narrow and narrow and narrow because of swelling of this lymphoid tissue, then a little bit of extra mucus, and now you can't breathe through the nose. Wow. Right? So, so when you, like how you talked about, like, you know when, when people do the parasite cleanse, mucoid plaque's yeah. a big thing. It's, it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. Like, I've done it a lot, never had anything like it, mm. right? But right. I've seen a few people that have had a lot, and I've always wondered, like, I've tried to think conceptually, what is that? Is that a defense mechanism from what they're putting in their stomach from the body? Like, mm. like what would you say the mucoid, is that, is that what it is, right? This is the mucoid lining yeah. defending itself. Yeah, it is. It is exactly that. Yeah, yeah. So okay. it's, it's a way of, you know, mucus is something that, that kind of stops, you think of these little critters crawling around. It's like, it's like a sticky, like, oh, I'm stuck, you know. And then mucus also contains lots of, uh, you know, white blood cells and so on to, to, to kill those little creepy crawlies, right? Wow. So it's, it's a kind of, it's a physical barrier that also contains a, a chemical function within it or biochemical function. Um, so, so yeah, you know, the, to link it back to the totem pole, the minute you, you've got a food sensitivity, let's say, or, or uh, anything that's sensitizing the immune system, like a leaky gut, well, then you're going to move into a forward head posture because you need to breathe, right? And breathing is right up high on your totem pole. It's, it's yeah. one of the most important functions that you will reflexively respond to without thinking about it. So you just go straight into a forward head posture. You go straight into mouth breathing. And then someone like us says, oh, look, you've got forward head posture. You should do exercises to, to bring that head back. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, that head's not going to come back until you sort out the breathing. Yeah. And, of course, the breathing is not going to improve until you sort out the immune sensitization. So that's why it's you know it's so important to work holistically. Otherwise, you're going to be missing the picture the whole time. Yeah, and it's, it's so logical. It makes so, so much sense. Cool. Uh, undeniable, man. And yeah, fully. And like, I just need to record you. And the next time we get a video, like something, like uh, we had a physio write to us the other day that anterior tilt isn't isn't linked. To, it, there's no good evidence that it's linked to any sort of pain. You know, um, that that spinal flexion under load isn't isn't a isn't a bad thing. And I just think, like, when I'm, you know, if you, I understand loads, but when you got a hundred kilos in your back, it just feels yeah. different. You don't want to be hanging off that shit. You can <laughs> yeah. feel it. You're hanging off ligaments and stuff. Like so black you're using the passive eh? system yeah. for your weak active system, you know? Um, yeah. And but these things are often where, you know, research really lets people down. And people, uh, you know, because we live in this kind of scientific, materialistic um, mindset, this level of consciousness that is essentially fairly rooted in the scientific materialistic level and not moving above into integrated and holistic understandings, mm-hmm then people put so much value in, in single research studies that show, you know, you, you can measure, say, 100 people and you'll find, um, you know, let's say 20% of them have got anterior pelvic tilt, 20% and probably probably more like 60 or 70% have got posterior pelvic tilt. Mm. Um, and, and then, you know, whatever's left, you've got, uh, you know, fairly neutral pelvic position. 
And then the researcher would say, so who's got the low back pain? And and they find, well, actually, people in every category have got low back pain. And so they say, so therefore, pelvic tilt doesn't drive back pain. <laughs> it's like, well, that's, that's not what that's telling you. It's, it's telling yeah. you that it's not the only thing, right? There's multiple things that drive back pain. Mm. And so you could have someone with anterior pelvic tilt, but they eat a really good diet. Uh, they don't stress their body too much. They get a good amount of sleep. They were hydrated. And they don't get back pain, right? Because they can regenerate at night. But if you start loading that same person up and you give them a shit inflammatory diet uh, and they stop sleeping so well, then they're going to get back pain, almost certainly. Mm. Even people with a you know good pelvic posture, if you put them on an inflammatory diet and get them lifting heavy loads and, and not sleeping up, they'll get back pain. It's that, you know, the, pil- the pelvic tilt is is an element. It's a contributing factor. It's like a straw that you're putting on the camel's back mm. that's stressing it, right? It's stressing it more than a neutral pelvis. Just just like, you know, a flexed lumbar spine stre- stresses the discs more than a neutral lumbar spine. Yeah. An extended lumbar spine stresses the facets more than a neutral lumbar spine. Mm. So, so the point is, it's just one stress. And the body can cope with stress, no problem, if everything else is equal. But when everything else isn't equal and, and optimal, let's say, then that's going to be a factor that's contributing to it. So it's this idea of kind of like, I, I call it a threshold effect. And uh, funnily enough, you know, before I met Paul, Paul talked about physiological loads, um, uh, as you know, and, and it's a brilliant concept. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I think a lot of people in the Czech system don't realize that that's a Czech thing. It's not, you know, it's not something that's talked about mm, out true. in the broader world. Yeah. Yeah, there's, some, there's there's a sort of almost parallel concept which is allostatic loads, yeah. um, mm. but but physiological load is really a, a check thing. Um, but but what I used to say to my clients is there's this kind of threshold effect, and um, you know people come in, let's say they've had headaches for years, and you say, okay, you know, have you have you um, tried cutting out chocolate, cheese, and red wine? They're classics that that drive headaches. So, oh yeah, I tried that three years ago. You're like, okay. All right. Have you tried any um, uh, previous treatments for your neck, for the mechanics of the neck? Oh, yeah, I saw a chiropractor for, for six months. I saw a physio, whatever. OK, fine. Um, how about hydration? And well, you know, I'm not so good with hydration. I suppose I could improve that. Right. Yeah. OK, good. And what you establish is that they've tried multiple different things at different times. But the issue is, is that if you've got forward head posture or neck tension, you know, and then you've got a little bit of stress in your life because you've got work pressures, deadlines, you know, finances, relationship issues, whatever it might be. Then you're not sleeping so well. Then you're dehydrated. Then you drink some wine, right? Then you, you, you know, then at that point, you're at the threshold where the headache kicks in. So for some people, cutting out the wine is enough and the headache goes, right? But for other people, they've got other things going on. So they've got a breathing pattern disorder. They've got, uh, I don't know, you name it, you know, other emotional elements, uh, you know, their blood, <laughs> blood sugars out, you know, all of these things, right? So they're way above the threshold. So they try cutting out wine, doesn't help. You know, like, so, yeah. they, so they then assume, well, the wine's not the issue, but the, the wine is contributing to the issue, just like posture is contributing to pain. It's one factor of a whole multitude of factors. So if we can optimize all of those things, then the pain will go. Yeah, man, that's... That's um, ain't that the truth? Yeah. Ain't that the mm. truth? <laughs> Spot on. And I have to ask you, like, with your education, say, like, mm. like post checks, so after all the check stuff, and just your own curiosity of ed- education, what guides you into what you're going to learn next? Like, what guides you into learning about parasites? What guides you into learning about just everything? Like, is it just your freedom, and you just learn whatever you're curious about at the time? Then, when you feel like you know enough, you move on, or is it is it structured? Um, I think I think life is what guides you. <laughs> it, um, it's whatever comes up, isn't it? You know, your client comes in with a with a condition you've not heard of. You you, you very quickly become an expert in that condition because you you have to you have to understand what that that is. You know, and and the beauty of the Czech system is that it doesn't teach you all the ten thousand conditions that you get in medical training. It teaches you the principles of health, which are actually quite simple. And then when someone comes in with this kind of you know, very, very rare disease that's been diagnosed by the world's top specialists, but they can't do anything with it. Then you say, okay, well, okay, let's let's look up this disease. And you say, okay, well, let's apply the, the, the health principles. Let's move you towards health. And often 
the symptoms and, and sometimes even the, the, the cause of that disease is addressed effectively. I mean, a classic example, not that it's that rare, but inflammatory bowel disease, you know, according to, to mainstream medicine is, is incurable. It's just something you're going to have to live with. You're going to have to take steroids. You're going to have to manage it. And the number of people that I've either worked with or have been students in the Czech system or are clients of students in the Czech system mm. who have completely reverse people's inflammatory bowel disease, not because they're treating inflammatory bowel disease, but because they're moving people towards more optimal health, better diet, better sleep, better hydration, better movement, better breathing, better thinking, all of those elements. And then suddenly the doctors can't find the, the markers of inflammatory bowel disease anymore. Mm. So this is this classic mm. sort of line from Paul, great quote, which is that, that health and disease cannot coexist in the same body. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best quote, eh? man. Is it doesn't yeah. it? Isn't it? If you think about how crazy this is, that inflammatory bowel disease, and they're not looking at what they're putting in the bowel. You yeah, know? just yeah. that full stop. Like it's this. No. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's 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 backwards, but it's like that with so many things. Like I remember yeah. when I had spondylitis thesis, and I was trying, I was ringing all these health, but spe- like low back specialists, all these people, and a couple people knew what it was, but everyone was pretty much like, oh, you just you just done. Yeah, you have, just fucked. Yeah. You know? I actually have a question for you, and just because you've seen more clients in your day, have have you seen a spondylolisthesis on someone with a posterior pelvic tilt? Or just yeah, you have. Yeah, in fact, one just recently. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, I was just, I was like, that's rare for me to see. So it is rare, but but it's so again, a concept Paul talks about is you've got kind of cats and salamanders. So you get people, and 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 that that's perhaps a you know a slightly sort of derogatory way of talking about people with really good kinesthetic intelligence, you know, so most people that are in our kind of fields have pretty good kinesthetic intelligence. And that's why we're in this field because we enjoy moving, right? We, we enjoy sports. We enjoy going to the gym or whatever it might be. So we like moving our bodies, mm. but you get people that don't like moving their bodies. And often that's people who, you know, found that they weren't the best at sport in the playground at school and they got picked last. And so they start to associate negative um, emotions with sports and with movement. And so across their lifespan, they, they end up becoming, you know, desk workers and they, they hate the idea of a gym. They hate the idea of going for a run. It, it seems horrible to them. And that's because of that association with the negative from, from their childhood, which is a real shame, you know, because of course in, in nature, people would move as part of everyday life. And yeah, you'd always have people that were better hunters or better gatherers or whatever, but, but you'd all be always be functioning as a team and you'd have different strengths and weaknesses for different tasks. But um, the, the point being back to spondylolisthesis is that if you've got someone who is very kinesthetically intelligent, what normally they'll do with a spondylolisthesis is they their body will strategize to posteriorly tilt the pelvis to try and reduce the pain. Um, yeah. But people that aren't so kinesthetically intelligent, they, they don't really know what to do with their body. It's just painful. And their body is in this anterior pelvic tilt, which is what creates the shear on the vertebrae and increases the likelihood of the uh, spondylolisthesis in the first place. And then it stops it from, you know, getting better once they've got the the issue there so and now it's not always down to this kinesthetic intelligence there's other factors that play as well but the, the guy who i've seen just recently you know when he came to see me because he's, he's had persistent low back pain you know i'm looking at him he's got quite a flat back and i'm thinking well this there could be some there, there was some signs of disc injury so i'm thinking maybe he needs some extension here but there's also a report that said he's got uh, a small spondylolisthesis. We're not sure if it, that's driving any of the symptoms. And, you know, with spondylolisthesis, a lot of people walking around with spondylolisthesis never knowing it because they don't have any symptoms. Mm. And they might go their whole life without realizing they've got this. And again, the listeners, spondylolisthesis is a slight slippage, right? It's one vertebrae slipping forwards on, on, on the, the one below. Um, <clears throat> but with this guy, you know, what I thought I really ought to do first and foremost was to experiment with increasing his lumbar curve and to um, tease the range of motion, see what range of motion he he could get in terms of extending the lumbar spine. Every time he did it, it flared him up. Right. And he liked, you know, he was comfortable when he sat down because he flexed. He was comfortable in bed in the fetal position because he was flexed. And I thought, okay, right, well, let's let's take a different strategy with this. Let's take him more into flexion and see if that helps. Which, you know, in theory, as you guys know, if you've got a flat lumbar spine, you don't really want to go into more flexion mm. In theory, because mm. that's taking you away from neutral. But in this case, his symptoms all went okay, or, or let's say they improved dramatically. So, yeah. so, so the symptom level reduced. And so now the strategy is 
to take him towards a more flat spine, okay? Which, you know, in in the short term is absolutely the right thing for him because whilst he's in pain, he's not going to be able to activate his stabilizer system. Mm. So we need to get him to a position where he's out of pain. When he's out of pain, then he can better activate his stabilizer system. Once that stabilizer or or tonic system, once that tonic system starts to work, muscles like the multifidus we were talking about earlier, now he's going to have an opportunity to heal. As and when that heals, then he can potentially start to reintroduce more extension. But it's always one of those things, you you know, sometimes there's a trade-off and you just have to walk around with a flatter back Mm. um, to to avoid your spondylolysis symptoms. Other times you can actually get back to a neutral spine, you know. So, And I think back from the check, uh, you basically use the pain teacher, right? Yeah. That's exactly, it. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. which you always you can't go wrong with the pain teacher. No, nah, fuck no. And that's what or, it feels or like. Or Kenya, yeah. Kenya, can you go wrong with the pain teacher? Have well, you? <laughs> well, from from that's personal experience yeah. with the spondy, from personal experience with the spondy, yeah. um it is right. Yeah, the pain teacher does teach you like I can't go too much into extension or I feel it. Yeah, okay. Especially if I if I run like a explosive movement through it like in jiu-jitsu or something like that. Um I just know that the 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 very range that I can go to without putting it into a feeling of like that doesn't feel comfortable. Right. So the pain teacher is just right there. And I, that's what, I was actually thinking that while you were talking about it, like that's, that's the most important thing is that, and it, it really ties in with the podcast because we're talking about that connection with your body. If you don't have a connection yeah. with your body, you're never going to really from personal experience, like feel where to go and where not to, you know what I mean? Mm. I think like that's why it's so important to train and put yourself out of atomical anatomical neutral and feel like, okay, that's too far. So you kind of get mm. to know what's safe for you. Yeah, yeah. it's um, yeah, it's 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 such a gift, and I think for people because there's a lot of um people listening that want to go into the check or they're new to it and students, mm. and just from experience, what I can talk about is that at the start, you, you like, and I think that's why you, you're such a good teacher, Matt. Is you teach concepts, and so does the check stuff. You te- they teach concepts, right? And that really empowers empowers you slowly, right? And at the start, yeah. it, it all seems so confusing. And and a good right. tip is for everyone listening that wants to do this is it's they'll like every exercise they'll try and remember how am I meant to do this exercise how am I meant to do this exercise and I'll try and remember how I'm meant to do forward ball rolls you know all this all this all this but when you do the exercises yourself a yeah. hundred times over and you really connect to how to make that feel it's generally right. Yeah. And, and, and it starts to all make sense. So then you don't need to remember, oh, how is this exercise meant to be done? Because you know how to move because you've learned the slings. You start to feel the slings in your movement. And, you, yeah. you know, now I can throw a ball better now than I could in high school. And, you know, it's, I showed my friends the other day because I was just thinking about the slings and breaking it down. And because um, and, I was hurting their shoulders when they were throwing. And, right, yeah. And now I think about when you tie the fascial slings into it too. I was thinking of the other day I got way more power when I load my my um, pec first and load yeah. that arm, which <laughs> then goes into the obliques, which then goes into the back and then throws my arm. And I realize I get way more power with that knowledge <laughs> than when I used yeah, to. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just yeah, yeah. work on your basketball shot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not too slingy. Is it? I mean, it sort of is. Yeah. <laughs> hey, um. Matt, I was going to ask you, because uh, a lot of people don't know this, but my dad passed away just before I went over to IMS4, and um, yeah. I was sitting down doing a podcast with Paul, and um, mm. at the end of the podcast, long story short, um, you sent me a message, which meant a lot to me, and it was, mm. uh, you said that Paul said the podcast went really well, blah, 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 which was scary as fuck for me, because he's like, you know, <laughs> he's, he's, yeah. he's the dude, and then um, you said, uh, Paul said to say your dad was actually in the room through mm. the podcast. Mm. And I just wanted to yeah. like, how, how did that come up? Like, that's just such a crazy, like it's such a crazy message mm. to get. Yeah, I, yeah, and yeah. it made my week, man. Yeah. Cause, cause I was like, yeah. fuck, I've had no, I've had no, I thought, I thought I would have had a spiritual connection with dad or something when he passed, but I haven't had anything. I haven't had, I've had a few weird dreams, but I haven't had that, um, yeah, that connection yet. So that was like a real, it was a, it helped me a lot. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, you know, as you know, Paul is, uh, kind of, quite talented in that way um you know he can connect with people's souls he can he can um use his third eye to to sort of see into more the the astral realm really um and so this is something that a lot of mystics can develop you know it's it's like anything you know if the three of us all went and played basketball Mm -hmm. between the three of us one of us is likely to have more aptitude for it 
Mm-hmm. Okay, one of us slightly less and the other one slightly less, right? Yeah. So you have certain aptitudes for things. And, and that doesn't mean that, let, let's say say that, you know, Jake, you're the best basketballer. Callan, you're, you're second best and I'm the worst. That doesn't mean I can't become the best mm. if I practice really hard. And, and, yeah. But if we practice to the same degree, then Jake, you're always going to be the best, right? Because you've just got an aptitude for it. Yeah. And Paul's got this aptitude for um, connecting to the, the spirit realm. Uh, and he's really developed it as well. You know, he's developed that across years and years of study, but also importantly, years and years of practice using Tai Chi, using plant medicines and so on. And so, um, you know, he th- he's just such an unusual cat because he, he <laughs> exactly. just goes so deep into any topic. And I've never known anyone like it. You know? know. And, and, and so, you know, I remember talking to him around 2005 or six because he was already quite heavily into spiritual work and reading Steiner's work and, you know, doing his Tai Chi every day and so on. And then the plant medicines were just emerging into his life at that time as well. Um, and I, you know, so f- to me, he was just way up there in terms of his ability to, like he, he was talking to me about, so bud, you've been having a stressful time recently. And I was saying, well, yeah, it's been a bit stressful. I've been organizing this big conference that that uh, I was getting him uh, to come and speak at. He said, yeah, I, I, I knew you were. He said, because I checked in on you a few times and I could see and feel the stress of you. And um, and I was like, whoa, you know, this kind of stuff is so, you know, out, yeah. out of my experience. Um, but um, but so, again, you know, he's kind of got this this um, aptitude for it. And some of that stems back to his childhood, which, you know, we talk about this, if you know, when Spirit Gym comes out, which is this kind of magnus so, opus yeah, that he's wait, working can't on. Can't wait for that, man, yeah. And, you know, the first chapter is all about his childhood and, and, and how really the intensity of his childhood and being brought up in, you know, a very challenging environment and a very stressful environment with violence and so on and being shut away in his room actually led to him, you know, being so sort of down and depressed, but also having this kind of fighter spirit that he's got, this warrior spirit, that he escaped his bedroom by remote travelling. Right. Mm-hmm. And it scared the living crap out of him the first time. So remote yeah. viewing, you know, so yeah. essentially going into yeah. his astral body and going and looking around the farm and then being like, whoa, wait a second. You know, he said something kind of emerges back in his body. He's like, whoa, what happened there? And then he's thinking, oh, you know, I just made that. I was just dreaming. And then he thought, well, I'll tell you what, I will try it again. And this time I'm going to try and test it. Typical Paul. I'm going to test it. You're not <laughs> assessing it again. And, uh, and so, you know, he's thinking, well, what what could I and how could I do this and I, and I forget the exact story but it's something like you know he, he thought well I know that my my stepdad was out doing something earlier and he would have put the tools back somewhere I'll try and work out where he's put the tools so he goes and you know, back into the state goes remote traveling or, uh, or remote viewing and and basically um, finds that the tool is in a certain place on his travels on then kind of astral you could call it astral yeah. traveling or remote viewing and um. And then the next morning he goes out and it's exactly where he saw it was. So now he thinks, well, shit, mm. you know, that could have been a lucky guess, but that was exactly what I saw. So then he starts to develop. This is, I think he was a 12 year old, right? <laughs> so, so the kind of foundation upon which he's built his ability to do these things. And then he studied it to death. He's practiced with it, you know, uh, every day. Um, and so, you know, when he was doing the podcast with you, he's sensitive to energies around him and he could sense your father in the room. Um, now, in terms of what you were saying about connecting with your father, one of the things, so my, my dad died when I was 31. And so, you know, that I was, uh, you know, well into the Czech system and working with Paul at the time. And Paul, Paul just said to me, Matt, you know, you should draw a mandala uh, of your life with your father and just write a note to him to say that, uh, you know, he's welcome back into your life in whichever form he wishes to take. Mm. Right. And so then I had several experiences of various animals appearing in my life and doing things that were weird. Like I had a blue tit following me. I don't know if you have blue tits, but they're like blue, 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 blue. <laughs> <laughs> the closest you can get to a bluebird. But we call it, yeah. Did you, did you get them? The, no, the tit no, bam. No. <laughs> <laughs> you bring a smile to your face. Um, <laughs> Here we they call they call the tip family. I was thinking it was a lizard. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a lizard. I thought it was a lizard. <laughs> right, 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 right. Blue tongue lizard. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but this little little 
bluebird is kind of following me around and uh you know initially just chirping at me and and then I, and I'm thinking about my dad and going out for a walk and and then it's following me and and it just kept seemed to follow me the whole way mm-hmm. and in at my dad's funeral we'd had this song the the, the somewhere over the rainbow by mm-hmm. Eva Cassidy uh you know where bluebirds fly you know that one oh, um wow. Wow. the rainbow where bluebirds fly and and it was just like whoa because it was it was again you could say oh well that's just coincidence and it and it could have been but the the fact was it's like it wasn't like oh i saw a blue tit it was like a blue tit kept following me and kept singing at me yeah. for about a kilometer wow and i'm wow. like what's this thing trying to say to me and and i'm like ah oh, ah oh, that's dad and I'm like, yeah it's part of hey, everything you know, how are you doing yeah, um man. And and there's and there's a bunch of different examples like that that I experienced across the years. So you know, I think some of it, what what I came to learn from that those experiences is that, you know, we're surrounded by spirituality. We, you know, of course, we, we, we're in a spiritual realm, and we're surrounded by spiritual messages. It's just we often don't have the eyes to see them. Yeah. <clears throat> That's what it feels you know, like. Yeah, you know, and. and Again, that song "Somewhere Over the Rainbow" that that's come up a number of times at very poignant moments in my life where there's some kind of massive stress going on. And then suddenly, in the background, you know, you notice there's some music, and you're you know caught up in this argument or this mm. you know head fuck or whatever it is, and then you're like, oh, there's that. You're like, oh yeah, that's that that's Whoa. that's so true because that the songs that I picked for his movie have been playing non fucking stop. Really, <laughs> and yeah. I and when when mum passed, I. The songs from her funeral made me really sad, but when Dad's mm. songs come on, they're just I yeah. feel happy. So I'm like, yeah. it's like it's interesting, yeah. And I think you're right. Yeah. Like what you see is like, well, because you're in a different state of development now, right? You, you've yeah. you've moved up some structure stages, and and and, and so when your mum died, quite possibly it felt much more material, right? You're like you know, you've lost something and you're never going to get it back. Yeah, exactly. And so you get that you get that association of sadness with it because you're in that scientific materialistic mindset that that uh you know your mother was was a physical being. Mm. And so you know that's true. You you won't see the physical mother again, but spiritually and energetically you'll feel her around you. Mm. Um and so you know now that you've lost your father at, at a stage where you're much more aware of that even if even if not as aware of of it as people like paul it's not so much sadness associated with it. it's more kind of inquisitiveness and mm. and wonder like you know maybe i can feel something here maybe there's yeah, still some that's it. connection right <laughs> but it's the, the the thing is it's not connection like you and i you know like we're all connecting now it's it's not as clear and and yeah. uh, objective it's it's much more subtle um, it is. but you've got to have that awareness about you. So you're talking about awareness of the body. Mm. This is like awareness outside of the body. It's awareness of the environment, awareness of the whole, of your connection to the whole, which is, of course, what spirituality is really. And what, what is, religion yeah. originally was, is that reconnection. That's what religion means. It's reconnect. Mm. Religion is like ligament. It's like ligature. It's something that connects. So it's when we reconnect with the big whole you know with 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 the, the greater picture mm. um and uh and so yeah you're probably much more attuned to that now yeah that's thank you yeah it's like you can do mushrooms and see two ants and get a full philosopher lesson you know what i mean <laughs> like <laughs> like it's that's like right, that, yeah. eh? it's like this constant yeah. you realize what's constantly happening around you and and like you said yeah. the reconnect the plant medicine can give you four four to five hours of that of um yeah whether you whether- one of the crazy things about that is that um the research into brain activity shows that actually you know you think if you're on a what in medicine or pharmacology you call a hallucinogen mm. right you know you think oh you're seeing psychedelic colors which sometimes you do you think um that the brain would be going haywire right there'd be mm. all kinds of electrical activity and all, all kind of craziness but what they can actually see is that the brain quietens right down yeah well and yet you're seeing way more. So what does that tell you? It, it, it implies at least the brain is a dampening mechanism to dampen out a lot of what you would normally see. So yeah. it's actually a way of allowing you to only process a small amount of information because otherwise you blow your mind. Yeah, yeah. fully. Fuck, that's a, such a good way of looking Man. at it. Yeah, I think it I remember you, like you said something like that in the Sydney workshop. You were like, you can walk past a bush 
and see a bush, or you can walk past a bush and see a whole ecosystem of yeah, like flies so and this, and it's a war going on. We forget that there's a war going on. Yeah, I know. Things just soil. mauling each other. I know. And, and, but do you know, yeah, it's, it's not even it's not even a war. It's you know, I think I, I think it's it's more like there's an interconnected web of of life happening on that mm. bush. And yeah, you know, of course, there's some flies being eaten by some spiders, and and there's some ants, you know, all kind of trotting around trying to find some food, and and then there's the the, the bees coming in and pollinating it and, and everything. But but really, what you get a sense of is the harmony of it. Mm. It's like an integrated, Perfect. harmonious system, mm. a, a little world all of its own that's just kind of playing along like an orchestra, you know. And and that's the beauty of plant medicines is that you see, you know, you don't become fr- more frightened of things like you know spiders and snakes and all the stuff that people tend to have phobias of you're much more like oh there they are they're just doing their job they're just you know mm. busy uh getting on with things and they're not interested in what i'm doing particularly i'm just i'm just being a human and they're just being a spider and it's like you know it's just be- beautiful to see that it's amazing um, how it can just still adapt how we can we can go in there and just rip something out and it'll it'll figure out how to survive you know it's like um yeah, yeah. the red belly black snakes here can now eat the cane toads because there's a lot of right. cane toads wow. in Australia, right? And huge, there's no predators, but now they're, now we found out that there's some snakes that can eat them and I'm not sure what else, but wow. yeah, which is cool. You know, it's like yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's starting to yeah. figure itself well, out. Nature <laughs> balancing itself, reharmonizing. <laughs> yeah. Like, how's Miller? Yeah. Remember Miller said uh, Australia introduced cane toads because there was cane beetles, but the cane beetles, right. were, the cane beetles were in the trees and the toads are on the ground. Oh, they were too high for their crops. <laughs> yeah. <they're>, yeah. <laughs> So and so it just just so now, now they've taken over. Like I was at a dam the other. I was at a, a pond the other day, man. And there's all these toads there. Really? Like yeah. I was just like, what the? So there used to be more. Huh? Um, but yeah, yeah, they're going. They're going through all of Australia soon. But yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but Colin, Colin, you you were asking earlier. If the, you know the pain teacher. You, I think you said the pain teacher is never wrong. Yeah. Said, oh, wait, where are they? And it's yeah. like, well, that's a it's a really good question because obviously when people have pain uh acutely it's it's really typically very helpful to have pain and and this is the gift of pain is that you know pain stops you from doing something that's injurious more than once hopefully you know you put your hand in the fire and you're like oh that really hurts so then you think well i better not do that again right so then you end up with a hand that yeah might be a bit burnt but it heal but if you keep putting your hand back in the fire you you, you can you know burn your hand right off right i mean you're going to end up really seriously injured so, so the, the the point is that pain has a, a really good function acutely, um, but as pain becomes more chronic, which is you know another word for for long term essentially, um, then it can still have a function because what it's doing is it's it's kind of nudging you. I've got a, a picture in one of my mm. papers that I wrote. By the way, it's, it's actually the Ghost in the Machine paper, which oh, I think yeah. we might have spoken yeah, about last that, time. Yeah. I quote with Paul. And um, I was just on a meeting yesterday with the Journal of Bodywork, who who that paper was published in, and um, it's it's the fourth most read paper of all time for the journal, which is wow, which sick. is really cool. wow, man. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. It's been, the journal's been going like twenty six years, wow. so yeah. to have the fourth most read journal, as uh, you know, maybe close to ten thousand articles, and yeah. we're at number four, so that's pretty good, that's isn't it? So, yeah, yeah. But um, but in that paper, we've got um, a picture of a, a, a finger kind of nudging the cortex right and the idea is that when you get pain in the body it's like a finger just nudging the cortex the brain to say hey there's an issue down here you ought to take a look right Mm -hmm. so with this persistent pain or chronic pain it's really kind of telling you that there is something going on and this is the mystery of it there's something going on but probably by now the tissues that were originally injured have healed Mm -hmm. right so you imagine you know you you strain a disc in the back you know create a disc bulge or you, you strain a joint um and you get inflammation in the joint but then still a year later the pain's still there maybe 10 years later the pain's still there well that that disc is long healed and that 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 uh joint is long healed so why are you still feeling pain this is where well the question you asked is pain always helpful it probably is it probably is in my in, in the majority of cases because this idea that you're being nudged and what it's really saying is that there's something going on down here that isn't optimal. Now, it's not no longer the disc or the joint that's the issue. What it is is that the nervous system is sensitized. Okay. And so why is the nervous system sensitized? Well, originally it would have been the pain that sensitized it. But then 
Other things that can sensitize the nervous system are your beliefs, right? So if you're anxious about the pain, if you have what's called um, a c- catastrophization or fear avoidance behavior because of the pain, all of these things can essentially lower your pain threshold and increase your pain perception, okay? Then you've also got the biochemical side of it. You know, if you've got a more inflammatory diet, then the nerves are much more sensitized. They're much more likely to send pain messages than they, they are to, to remain quiet. Um, if you've got organs that are um, sending sensory drives back into the, the, the spinal cord, and, and, you know, that could be something like, oh, I just feel like I'm a bit bloated a lot of the time, or it could be something like I get terrible gut pain or terrible period pain or terrible kidney pain, whatever, you know, those messages all coming back into the spinal cord and sensitizing it. And what that's meaning is you're still feeling that original injury because of the sensitization from these other issues. So it is still helpful because the pain is telling you there's something of normally multiple things that need to be addressed, but it's not giving you, or let's say your brain's not interpreting it necessarily in in the exact right way because it's it's kind of thinking, oh, well, that's my old back injury. But the injury is not the back injury at all. It's the nervous system. Mm-hmm. Now, one time when pain definitely isn't helpful is where you've got someone with this persistent pain kind of situation. And let's say, you know, you've assessed them, they've got a flat back uh, and an upper cross syndrome, a fairly classic pattern. So you give them a prone cobra, right? Because, you know, that's going to help to address their balance. It's going to help to sort of condition the right muscles and so on. And so they start doing the prone cobra and they're like, ah, that, that hurts my back. And you say, okay, that's interesting because based on all of your assessments, that shouldn't be the case, mm-hmm. okay? Probably the reason that their back is hurting is because their, immune, sorry, their nervous system is oversensitized, right? So in this case, the pain is not being helpful. And what you can do is you can do something called time contingent um, training instead of symptom contingent training. So what you do, which is kind of what we do in any instance, is you say, right, I want you to train in this prone cobra. It's going to be painful, but the pain isn't actually harming you. Okay. Cause hurt doesn't always equal harm. Mm. And now that we're, let's say, you know, five years down the line from the original injury, we know there's no tissue injury there anymore. That's cleared up. That would have cleared up probably in the first three months, maybe in the first six months, sometimes a little bit longer, but there's no tissue damage there anymore. What you're perceiving is pain through a sensitized mm. nervous system. So what we wanted to do is we want to teach you that you can feel the pain, so we can do the prone cobra and you're just going to work through it. Okay. And let's say we're going to do it for a, for a minute initially. So after 10 seconds, they're in pain. We're going to do six reps of 10 seconds. So they do, do the 10 seconds, then loads of pain. You say, come back down. We're going to go again, take a breath off. We go, go again. Mm-hmm. And they're feeling, okay, you get to the end of the minute. Okay. Well done. You've done a minute. So we've hit the minute. We didn't stop because you're in pain. We took you to the minute. So let's have a little walk around, see how you feel. They do that. Have a glass of water. Now, how's your back feeling? And they're like, well, it's fine. <laughs> right, good. So do you, think, do you think that injured you doing those prone cobras? And they're like, no. Like, good. Okay, that's brilliant. Because now what you've just learned is that the pain hasn't hurt you, right? So so the, the, the oh, hurt doesn't good. equal pain, right? So now what you can do is, is you can lower your anxiety around it, okay? Mm. So you don't have to be – so we can do that again. And you're not going to be so anxious this time because now you know that you're going to get up, walk around afterwards, and the pain's not going to be any worse, you know, possibly even better. So so now their anxiety levels drop. And anxiety, it's the psyche, it's right at the top of the totem pole, right? Mm. That can actually change the whole kind of biochemistry in the brain. The brain has this whole medicine chest of different drugs it can release and different kind of um, strategies it can deploy to either upregulate pain or downregulate pain. Okay, you heard of endorphins. Everyone's heard of endorphins. Mm-hmm. That's like morphine. It's, it's essentially a sort of endogenous, like a, 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 a endogenous means something that's produced in the body. It's, it's supposed to be taken from outside the body. So it's an endogenous version of morphine, right? And your body will produce that to desensitize the nervous system if it perceives there's no threat. But if you're still perceiving that there's a threat, then it will it will not produce that morphine, right? Because mm. it because it, it actually wants you to feel pain. Because yeah. if there's a threat and pain, then it's like, oh, we need to avoid the pain because we want to avoid the threat. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. Man. That, I, makes, that, that makes so much sense. Um, Susie Neville told me 
told me once she was she because I had a client that was so sensitized that anything mm. anything was just causing whole body pain sort of thing. She was very right. afraid. She right. was very afraid. And then Susie had a she, she told me she had a story. She had a girl uh, like it, and her rest period was laying on her back, box breathing. So it wasn't mm. you know a minute on, thirty seconds off. But that thirty seconds off was used like that breathing. That time yeah. was used instead of just laying there. It was used mm. to desensitize her. And then she, the, she said the first time she did that. She went back home and called her and she goes, oh, I'm not in pain from the workout. So it shows you the importance, like tying the breath in, tying, again, the psyche, the top of the totem pole, and just pulling those yeah. concepts wherever you can instead of being so uh, – because you know what I got caught, again, for people listening at the start, is just the numbers, just it, you know? This pelvic tilt yeah. seven degrees, that pelvic tilt 10 degrees. And, like, and teaching that at the start, it sort of has to be because it's so complex, yeah. you know? It has to be. Um, yeah. But yeah. then with experience, you start to like play with things and, and watch how, you know, releasing this area over here all of a sudden changes the pelvic tool over here and you start to see how it's all start to be connected. And I think what's gold yeah. about those tools are, because again, a lot of people will say, um, you know, we get people say, oh, you know, the bony morphology of the pelvis is different on everyone. So you can't always trust that. But what I can trust is that it's the same spot I go to every time and then I'll see if what, if, what makes a change with my exercise or not. So exactly. I don't care if it's actually seven degrees or 10 degrees, but if it's 10 degrees and it goes to seven degrees, I know, oh, okay, I'm out of change, whether that's the actual yeah. degree. So it's like... Yeah, and that's, that's really that's really well backed up by research as well. So so if, you know, if you're getting into one of these debates with someone who's more research oriented, um, then then that that's absolutely true, that accuracy is, is poor. It doesn't matter how experienced you are, the likelihood of you getting the exact right spot is pretty low. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they did a lot of this research on... Uh, using physiotherapists that had at least 25 years of experience and they just found that the accuracy was all over the shop so what it means is that you know some people were five millimeters too high some people were five millimeters too low you know and and it didn't really matter how long you've been practicing that there wasn't good accuracy amongst practitioners but what there was is there was good precision and precision means as you just said Callan, you go back to the same spot every time so if i went five millimeters too high you went five millimeters too low Every time I'm going to go five millimeters too high, and every yeah. time you're going to go five millimeters mm. too low. So, so the point is with something like pelvic tilt. If I'm high or at the PSIS, I'm possibly going to say, "Well, that that's a bit more anterior than than, than you're going to measure it." Right mm. now, if I measure it as say twelve degrees, which is a little bit above the reference range of seven to ten for a woman. Um, then I might think, okay, that's a bit anterior. Maybe I'll give her some some uh, exercises to address that, some stretches to address that. You might measure it as 10 degrees. Mm. So you might say, okay, she's right on the border. I probably won't address that. That's okay. But if I measure it as 17 degrees, which is not uncommon to go quite high like that, mm. you're going to measure it as 15 degrees. So the point is, if there's a significant anterior pelvic tilt, yeah. we're both going to find it. Yeah. If it's near to the... To, to, to the the border, this is why I always say when I'm teaching this stuff, is that we always want to move people in the direction of correction, but we don't want to be obsessive about it. It's not like you have to get mm. to a 7 to 10 degree pelvic tilt. Mm. It's just that's the direction of correction we want to move people towards. Um, and same with the, the, the neutral spine and, and with any of these uh, kind of measurements that we take. It's like, well, let's coax the body in that direction and see how it responds. Like I did with this guy with the spondylolisthesis, we're coaxing him towards a neutral spine. His body responded by saying, I don't like this. You're like, okay, that's almost certainly then that this is an active spondylolisthesis, symptomatic. We should take you actually away from the direction of correction in this instance so we can get rid of the symptoms Mm. and then we'll reevaluate. Yeah, so that's so cool because I think about, all right, so this guy's trying to possibly get ligamental stability from going into a flat back posture and mm. and during that initial phase you could have them there till it calms down and say the inflammation or whatnot i'm not sure how long term it was and then start bringing in that well you almost because the curvature is almost the contraction of those muscles right so if he's all atrophied there you almost need to i guess you could still contract it but in a, in a flatter position and then try and get a hypertrophy response yeah. to that that lumbar region yeah yeah absolutely yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. This is one of the concepts, again, I, I try and teach is, is this idea of the inner range and the outer range of, of muscles. And so, you know, if you're trying to, in that example, if you're trying to make the low back muscles strong, but in a lengthened position, then you would just change the tempo on the way you're moving. Um, I, let's try and give an example. So if we're doing, I mean, Jefferson curl is probably quite a good one because, you know, 
you, you're going right the way through a full spinal flexion into a, into a deadlift position, right? Um, and so what you might do is you might say, um, I want you to do a tempo of maybe, say, six seconds between the ground and getting the bar up to the knees or to, or to mid thigh maybe, right? So six seconds coming up to there. And then from mid thigh, one second back up to upright, one second back down to mid thigh, and then six seconds back down to the ground again. So what you're doing is you're actually training that muscle per rep. You're doing 12 seconds in that outer range where the, the actin myosin interdigitation is, is out like this. It's kind of f- further apart. And then you're doing just two seconds where it's in the inner range, mm. right? For, from mid thigh up to full deadlift. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So you're spending more time in the outer range and loading the outer range more. So the person gets stronger in the outer range. So they actually uh, flatten their spine, but whilst getting their lumbar erector stronger. Yeah, man, that's that's so cool. That's yeah, that, that makes so cool. much sense. Um, then. Mm. So, so to sort of bring it all together, hopefully we we got the HLC one online now. Is it so HLC one online has changed now? Yeah, yeah. So it's been upgraded. Cool. Um, you know, they've, they've re- reshot a lot of it and reorganised it. So it's just you know just m- more effective, more efficient for for people to study. Um, you know, I think they they went through all the analytics and they found that what would happen is there'd be quite a high drop off rate because it was a very long course. Right. Um, in terms of, yeah, in terms of duration uh, on the on the videos, so I don't know the exact timings, but but people get sort of twenty percent into it, and quite often by then they'd stop mm. because it was kind of all one long course. Yeah. Um, so what they've done is they've broken it down into more bite-sized chunks cool. and and also, you know, sort of just consolidated it down into to, to more key information. Cool. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think it's it's going to be way more effective for learning. Awesome. Um, and uh, and that's coming out, I think, in January, something like that, um, 2024. Cool. So that'd be, that'd be – And then yeah, yeah, and yeah. obviously there's, there's going to be Czech courses in Australia mm. this year, right? Like there'll yeah. be some IMS 1s and 2s and that going. Yeah, um, and, that's it. Yeah. And then hopefully, and that's for all those people that are sort of getting that yeah. in. Hopefully, IMS four. Yeah, get your level three done now, and then get your level three, 25. get up to level three, and then we're doing it at corrective. And who knows, maybe other ones here. Yeah. Um, all right, yeah. Feb twenty twenty five, and that'd be cool to get oh, a really man. big team. Yeah, to I want to yeah. sit in on that one again. I got to. I yeah, definitely. Like it was, it's the yeah. best course I've ever done. So. And we'll have to do an in person podcast. But man, we got to do more of these. We got to get more. I know, <laughs> I know. It's like. this. I can honestly say this. This is probably my favorite podcast. We've done a lot. This is my favorite podcast for me because it's just. Yeah. I just learned so much and I'm yeah. so passionate about it. And, you, and uh, you're so passionate about it. And it's yeah. just. Yeah. It's conceptual learning and it's just exciting. I know. For me. Dude, that's why Level Four was so good because it was just like fucking 10 days of that. And it was just like. Yeah. Like. Yeah, I was just glued the whole time. Like, I'm never, I mean, I was eating really good too, so I felt good, but fuck, is this. Man, what yeah. we'd love to do one time is almost like I'll do it to, to our following, like, yeah. ask Matt a question and get, like, that would be sick. choose, like, the, you know, whatever, 10 best yeah, questions be or fun. something and just, um, and just go off the top, you know? Yeah, that would yeah, yeah, yeah. like, be sick. We could do a live or something. Yeah, like, well, you, we could, yeah, do this and just chop it and we'll yeah, true. do lots of reels and, yeah. yeah, yeah, fully, yeah. fully. Yeah. That would be it'll, it'll sick. Be, it'll be cool for the content, yeah. Sick. Um, man, what a potty. Thanks yeah. thanks for coming thanks on. Thanks so much for coming on, man. And thanks for inviting me. Really, yeah, really fun. appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll yeah. Have to catch up soon. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah, 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 yeah. definitely when you come over here, it'd be cool to um, just do some whatever we can do together. Yeah. Yeah. Like on top yeah, of your work. workshop or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah that'd yeah, be yeah. really cool. Definitely going to do that. And yeah. um, I really want to do some like one-on-one stuff with you just to go over a few of the stuff, a few of the things from IMS4. Um, yeah, I'll, course, show you, yeah. I'll show you an email soon. <laughs> yeah. And, okay. And for good. all people listening, you have a mentorship role in the world now, do you? Like, do yeah. you? Yeah. You, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah, yeah. So it's there. So they're on my my, my website. Um, and yes, yeah, so if people want to do mentoring with me, then that's uh, an option for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So still, you know, obviously working with clients, doing mentoring, doing my teaching with the institute, and a bit of writing here and there, and uh, helping Paul with this. Spirit Gym is the, is one of the big projects at the moment, as as well as just developing the uh, education for the institute. So yeah. there's a fair few things going on. Yeah, but that's, always that's, busy. Do we have a close uh, arrival date for Spirit Gym for the people? Well, yeah. So just just to give a quick overview on that, it's mm. it's um you know started out as Paul's writing a book to Paul's writing a tome, you know, that is kind of going to be more than two thousand pages long. Yeah. And so what what we decided initially was we're going to have to break that down into maybe five books. And then, you know, again, just re-evaluating the whole position, it's like, 
even that means that it's going to be each book's going to be about 400 pages so that's a big book so what we've done now is going to break each book down to around the 100 page mark maybe a little bit more um but in that kind of region so it's a, a lot more uh digestible and so the first book of the series is due out in the first quarter of 2024 oh, that's awesome. that's what the aim is so we we're thinking maybe february but but it might be pushed back to march you know how these things are um but um but so that'll be the first book and then of course there'll be another 14 to come after that and paul's whole goal with this is that he really sets up a community where because essentially spirit gym is the the idea of it is that we live in a gym for spirits right this the world is like a gym for spirits and we meet resistance day by day different challenges and we're either already set up and good and conditioned for those challenges or sometimes we're not and it's like i can't lift this load so sometimes you need someone else to help you someone else to show you or you need to train up to be able to overcome that load and it's down to you as to whether or not you want to do that whether you want to participate so that's the kind of metaphor of spirit gym if you oh, like good. man I'm, yeah i'm really it's excited really, for really, that even yeah. for like everything life business like yeah just i know everything yeah. i just can't wait to delve deeper i i love it that's yeah. I feel drawn, and my yeah. soul knows that's where I need to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it'll be yeah, nice. right, right. Also, and, and it's pretty practical for people, isn't it? Yeah, and so exactly. So, so you know, obviously, loads of theory as well for people that really want to get into the, the the sort of conversation around it all. But then, what Paul's so good at is making these things practical. And so, there's going to be a, a kind of practical guide that goes alongside the book, and also there's going to be a, this community that Paul sets up where you can kind of month by month engage with Paul directly, um, ask your questions. He can provide drills wow, uh, to work nice through that kind of thing. Um, and, and the idea, as I understand it, I don't know all the sort of, uh, you know, accounting behind it, but it's it, the idea is supposed to be accessible. So people, you know, it's not like a yeah. high end premium program, only a few people can afford. It's like anyone can access this if that's what you're interested in mm. and just become part of the community. And essentially it's kind of taking people through the check process mm but with more of a kind of spiritual overtime to it. Yeah. Awesome. Really excited to watch that and um, excited for the, excited for next year. Yes. <laughs> it's indeed. Good year. <laughs> good. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks, thanks for having you, man. Again. I'll speak to you shortly. Great and to see you, boys. Yeah, we both yeah. will. Much love. Thank you. Great stuff. Take care.